Good morning or afternoon, all. My name is Aaron Sane, and I'm from the Natural Resource Governance Institute, NRGI. And on behalf of our host, Carbon Tracker, I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar on Nigeria's energy transition, a path to a lower carbon world. This is one in a series of country focused webinars that Carbon Tracker is hosting in the run-up to COP26. Future sessions will look at India, countries in Central Europe, and the Pacific Rim. We've got an interesting panel, uh, but I'll quickly try setting the scene a little first. Nigeria gets held up all the time as the poster child for unhealthy dependence on oil, which in many ways is unfair since its economy and its people have so much more going on. The petroleum sector itself is only a tiny part of the country's GDP, but it's also still the government's main source of revenue and critically dollars. Dollar is woven into Nigeria's consumption-based import-driven economy in all sorts of ways. Dollars buy many of the things ordinary Nigerians need for daily life food, medicine, cars, clothing, fuel. So what could happen when the global energy transition makes that flow of petrodollars dry up? Well, the 2020 oil market shock, together with the recent impacts of COVID, may offer some possible answers. Nigeria's oil revenues in the first half of 2020 were two-thirds lower than what was budgeted. And at one point in March, NNPC, the National Oil Company, reported that 50 cargoes of oil and 12 tankers of liquefied natural gas couldn't find buyers. It wasn't long before the government slashed the budget and proposed $11 billion in new borrowing. Meanwhile, in the real economy, dollar shortfalls shut down local manufacturers and importers, drove up inflation, stranded billions in investor cash, left private depositors unable to access their funds or use their credit cards, and probably contributed to food shortages in some parts of the country. As bad as all of that sounds, we should keep in mind that the worst of it only lasted a few months, not forever. From a global climate perspective, it's also worth keeping in mind that even though Nigerians' emissions per capita are small now, the country could become a significant emitter as it industrializes and as its large population keeps growing, depending on which fuels it extracts and uses at home. Nigeria can't do that much to control the shape or the pace of the energy transition, but it can prepare. And so it's good to come together like this to hear about risks, plans, and possibilities. And for that, I'm going to turn over to our panelists. First up, we're going to hear from Janet Logan. Janet is the UK government's regional ambassador for the Middle East and Africa. She joined the FCO, now FCDO, in 1986. She served in the Far East, the Balkans, the Middle East, and Africa, and has worked with NATO as UK political advisor and the United Nations. She has a wide policy development and humanitarian experience across post-conflict and fragile states and in bringing the principles of the Sustainable Development Agenda 2030 together for wider strategic goals, including COP26. And we'll hear from Mike Coffin, a senior analyst in the oil and gas team at Carbon Tracker. Mike joined Carbon Tracker in 2019 his work focuses on identifying transition risks within the oil and gas industry as the global energy system evolves. Then, for some reactions and perspectives from the Nigerian government side, we'll hear from Kilechi Ofuegbu. Kilechi is a senior technical advisor to the Honorable Minister of State for Petroleum Resources and has 22 years of oil and gas industry experience in policy development and implementation, legal and regulatory affairs, litigation and dispute resolution, 
contract engineering and management, among others. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn over to Janet Logan. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, thank you very much, Aaron, for that uh, fulsome introduction. Um, as the UK's COP26 ambassador for the Middle East and Africa, uh, I'm one of four uh, regional ambassadors. The others are covering Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, the Far East and uh, Central Europe and Central Asia. And our job during this run up to COP26 is really to put a focus on the main issues and to focus attention on the UK's uh, goals as the incoming presidency for COP26. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about COP26 and the UK's goals and then situate Nigeria into that um, setting. So what is the significance of COP26? Well, it's happening five years after Paris, the Paris Agreement in 2015, um, although we had to delay it for a year by COVID uh, reasons. Um, COP26 is meant to be a checkpoint uh, on the path forward from Paris, where we can look and see how much progress have we made over the last five years as countries, as all of the parties who are um, signed up to the Paris Agreement, and how can we improve and enhance our ambition for our climate action as we go forward. I just want to recall also the other agreements that were made in 2015, because it was an important year. The Sustainable Development Agenda 2030, was started in that year. And we also had the Sendai Disaster Risk Reduction uh, Framework, which was set up that year to help build resilience um, amongst uh, countries to, uh, particularly to climate shocks, uh, but also to, to other uh, uh, critical events that might occur them. So these three different uh, parts of the agenda are all actually very much interlinked. And this is important to when we come to consider the financial aspects of this. So I just wanted to put out there that we have uh, these very broad international agendas that are interlinked when it comes to climate. Um, I mentioned COVID and COVID has had a very big impact across uh, all of the world, but also across a number of different sectors, if we can put it like that, not only in terms of um, climate um, and, and our, our postponement of COP26, but also it's had an impact on health, it's had an impact on education, it's had an impact on um, economies uh, worldwide. And we see that these two um, uh, global crises of climate and of COVID are very much interlinked. So when it, it comes to saying, what is the significance of COP26? When we come out of that global meeting, we want to ensure that we have a global commitment to building back better from COVID and making that building back better a green and resilient recovery. So just focusing in on the Paris Agreement and the goals that we as the UK presidency have to bring forward for the meeting in Glasgow later this year, they all reflect the Paris Agreement itself. There are four of them. First one is mitigation. And uh, we are really focusing on the need for 2030 emissions reductions and for achieving net zero around the middle of the century, while also recognizing the economic and industrial transitions necessary to deliver this. And this is particularly important for countries in Africa on energy, transport and forests. Uh, Glasgow must also be the COP. We've said that consigns coal to history signals the end of polluting vehicles and kickstarts massive cuts to methane emissions. And we'll come back to the issue of energy. Of course, that's the focus of us of, of our session today, um, a little bit later. Um, the second goal is adaptation. Uh, this is about protecting people and nature, particularly the world's most vulnerable communities, including, of course, in Africa. It includes enabling resilience through better planning and infrastructure, improving early warning and climate resilient agriculture, as well as progress on issues such as loss and damage. The third goal is about finance. And this is where we are really working hard to deliver the developed nation's commitment in 2015 to deliver 100 billion US dollars of climate finance every year for the developing world. That is the focus of the UK's presidency of the G7. 
Um, and it, we also want to put an emphasis on improving access to the funding that already exists, as well as ensuring that we hit that $100 billion target or exceed it. We also want to ensure that we, we and this goes particularly towards the financial institutions, that there are improved concessional terms for that finance that are available. And this is very important for uh, countries in the developing world. I also think, though, that in this, on the financial side, there are significant opportunities for private finance in greening the financial system um, and in taking um, a, a broader, resilient, uh, green uh, investment approach. The fourth goal is collaboration. And collaboration means really strengthening the foundation on which we collectively deliver these changes. It's not just for the public sector. It's also about the private sector in all of its uh, manifestations. It's about societies and communities coming together with their action um, and bringing in, for example, uh, knowledge from indigenous people, making sure that uh, all groups uh, without uh, reference to gender, um, the youth groups are also being able to be part of the conversation. And this is one of the reasons that we're committed to holding a physical in-person summit in Glasgow to enable everybody to sit at the same table face to face um, and allow for the specific inclusion of all elements of society. So let me just come in for a, a few moments um, and, and look at those goals as they apply to Nigeria. And, and remember, the, the goals are not goals just that the UK is setting uh, on, its, on its own. Uh, the UK is the presidency, which is, uh, if you like, the chair, the convener of the parties uh, to the um, climate change um, conventions. And that means all parties have to play a full part. So um, for Nigeria, um, we are looking to see the, the publication of Nigeria's next enhanced uh, NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution, uh, well ahead of COP26. Um, and we're looking to see that that new NDC, which I know is being worked on at the moment, um, ensures that Nigeria has a credible energy transition pathway. That energy transition must also ensure greater access to energy for more Nigerians. Uh, we know that energy access in Nigeria is currently poor. Uh, it was estimated, I, I have figures back from 2018, that over 85 million Nigerians did not have access to modern energy services. And of course, without access to energy, we're not really going to see um, a full access to rights, including things like education and healthcare, um, or a broad based economic development. So with the COVID-19 related economic slowdown and current low oil prices globally, this is an opportune time for Nigeria to invest in diversifying and strengthening its economy through a focus on clean energy to drive that long-term economic growth and meet renewable energy targets. Uh, key components of a clean energy transition in Nigeria would include power sector reform, decentralized renewable energy and improved energy efficiency. In terms of power generation, we know that the levels of renewable energy in the mix are too low, with solar representing less than 1% of the energy mix back in, again, uh, 2018. Um, those figures were showing 0.13 gigawatts of solar versus 11.46 gigawatts of gas and 2.06 gigawatts of large on-grid hydro. Nigeria has large reserves of gas, and these are important, but for Nigeria to stay on target, gas definitely needs to be a transition fuel in the longer term plan. Once generated power, of course, needs to be transmitted. And we know that Nigeria's grid cannot currently take more energy input. So grid reform and grid expansion to enable grid good grid management is also key to energy transition and greater energy access. And finally, for distribution, renewable energy needs to be permitted to be commercially competitive in Nigeria. Although it can appear counterintuitive, removing Nigeria's government's, the Nigerian government's fossil fuel subsidy is vital to make the renewable sector more investment friendly. The cost of producing renewable energy is lowering every day, and Nigerians should be able to benefit from that lower cost energy. Now, the UK has taken into account the, the, the need for real support to, uh, to countries who are engaging in designing energy transition plans and um, have established what is called the Energy Transition Council. It is chaired by Alok Sharma, the, uh, the COP president designate, 
and Damalola Ogunbi, the CEO of Sustainable Energy for All, who is uh, himself Nigerian. And the Energy Transition Council brings together the financial and technical expertise to accelerate clean energy transition in key countries. This includes bringing together multilateral development banks, international organizations and country development partners. And this is one way that we can support clean energy progress in Nigeria. Um, the UK bilaterally, uh, I know, is working very closely with Nigerian officials and ministers to support the delivery of key priorities in Nigeria, including a focus on on-grid and off-grid um, aspects of this energy transition. Um, and I think um, just on that point of the Energy Transition Council, it's a very active uh, body and the next meeting at the ministerial level will be in the middle of July. Um, and uh, at that point, there will be a, a real publication of the, the practical offer, if you like, to countries who are, who are um, uh, accessing um, ETC help through a rapid response facility and through the mobilization of funding from multilateral development programs. So um, uh, from, from that perspective, I, I wanted to give you really an overview of uh, where, where COP26 is going, how we as the COP presidency uh, see Nigeria fitting into that, and a little bit about the Energy Transition Council as a mechanism um, for support where, where development partners are supporting, supporting uh, clean energy progress. Um, I think I'll stop there because uh, there'll be plenty more to say and lots of questions are already coming up um, in the uh, the Q and A's. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet, for that overview on the road to COP. And uh, next, we'll hear from Mike Coffin. Mike. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you for thank you for the introduction, Aaron, and uh, for those those words, Janet, of introduction. It really helps set the scene. So. So at Carver Tracker, our focus is quite uh, historically been on company analysis and understanding the risks to companies uh, and, and that they face through the energy transition. And what we did in what we've done in this most recent report we published in February called Beyond Petrostates is really look to understand rather than the, the risk that companies face, actually the risk that countries face, those nation states and particularly the petrostates as we call them, the, these 40 countries that we have defined um, who are particularly dependent on oil and gas for their government revenues and particularly for their fiscal sustainability. So in this report, um, we, we explore these themes uh, and I'd like to give you a high level overview of that report today um, with a particular focus of, of, on Nigeria and teasing out some of the, the particular implications for Nigeria before we then move in, 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 on into the, the Q&A. So I've got about a 10 minute presentation here uh, to, to really go through that. So. In terms of the key messages, really, that I'd really like to land today, ultimately, the energy transition is accelerating. I think that that's very clear. It's, but ultimately, that will drive lower future demand for oil and gas. So the fiscal sustainability of those countries, of those producing countries, um, is particularly impacted. And we see that lower demand for oil and gas uh, will, will significantly impact uh, oil and gas revenues. Around the world, we see that they will be halved under a low carbon scenario in the coming decades compared to the past two decades. Now, depending on how important uh, the oil and gas sector is to overall government revenues, this, this means that different countries, uh, sorry, countries are differentially vulnerable to the energy transition and this loss of revenue. And Nigeria, we identify as being a particularly vulnerable, um, uh, particularly vulnerable to this loss of revenue. And as well as Nigeria being the most populous petrostate that we identify within our, within our analysis. Um, for Nigeria and, and actually all petrostates, it's critical to diversify government revenues away from our reliance on oil and gas. And this is reliance on oil and gas exports for your, your revenue stream, particularly. And um, it's critical that other countries as well, you look to the existing petrostates as, um, sorry, to not look to existing petrostates as an example of um, future prosperity and, and, and oil and gas for their future growth, and, and don't look to become emerging petrostates as well. So I think there are sort of almost lessons to be learned from, from the petrostates experiences and, and the, then the challenges they currently are facing as a result of the energy transition. Um, and then we'll finish with some important considerations for policymakers, both from a domestic perspective, but also from the international perspective too. So in the macro picture, it's in all interest, all country's interest to act on climate change. Um, it's known that the physical impacts disproportionately impact developing nations in the global south. 
Um, and so while they may be reliant on oil and gas right now, it's within their countries, all countries' interest to limit global warming. We have rapidly falling renewables costs, and this creates a huge opportunity to increase access to domestic energy supply, um, as well as you know, energy security. And of course, one of the big, big pieces around climate change is also around better air quality and the lives of the, um, the world's population that live in cities. We talked the energy transition is accelerating from a number of different reasons, both from societal awareness, uh, growing policy ambition to meet the goals, for example, of the Paris Agreement, um, but then from a listed company perspective, there's also a very, very much increasing pressure on listed companies. And we saw two very key examples of that yesterday at both Shell and Exxon. But ultimately, the energy transition will lead to lower, lower oil and gas demand. And what is the impact of that? Well, ultimately, government derive revenues from um, oil and gas in two main ways, the petrostates. Firstly, through the direct investments of our national oil companies, so these NOC investments. And then secondly, um, the taxation. In, in a very broad sense of the word, of both NOC activities, but, but more crucially from company activities, so listed company activities in, in, the, in those countries. And those two, uh, those two aspects form the, the revenue streams of governments from global oil and gas. Lower global demand will impact both, lower, will create lower volumes uh, of oil and gas produced in the future, but crucially, prices will also fall. So lower demand, prices will fall. And these two effects combine to reduce government revenues. In fact, we find that the price impact has a bigger impact on revenue streams than the volume impact. So I think the focus is often on the volume piece, that is the associated price reduction or commodity price reductions that will impact revenues most. What we do at Carbon Tracker, we, we used our least cost methodology and we used the model upstream oil and gas to identify if the world pursues, which, which we certainly very much hope it will do, a low carbon scenario, what is the impact of revenue streams compared to the business as usual plans of both companies and governments? And so what will the loss of revenue be? Globally, we see a $13 trillion revenue shortfall versus expectations um, a, under a low carbon future versus under uh, a, um, a kind of business as usual. This isn't to say that the low carbon future is bad. It absolutely is not. That is what needs to happen for, for the, the health of the world globe. However, we need to recognize the revenue shortfall from oil and gas that, that will result. For Nigeria, we see a $230 billion revenue loss to the government. So that's over 60% of its oil and gas revenue over the coming decades under a low carbon scenario. And what's critical is that we have an orderly, orderly transition um, away from oil and gas, gas, and that will actually minimize the further revenue losses in addition to these shown here. So what we did, having looked at that, we take our analyses together uh, to look at the vulnerability of these petrostates. So this is quite a busy slide, but we think it, it really encapsulates everything that, that we're talking about in, in, one, in one key diagram. So on here, you have the 40 petrostates and they're sized by their population. So you see that, for example, Mexico, Russia, Iran, and of course, Nigeria highlighted the arrow are some of the most populous or the most populous countries within our study. On the x-axis of this graph, what we show is the current fiscal de dependence on oil and gas revenues. That is, what proportion of your overall total government revenue comes from oil and gas? On the y-axis, what we show is the potential oil and gas revenue shortfall under a low carbon scenario versus business as usual. As you said, Nigeria was over 60%, and we see that in the center of the graph here, that that revenue shortfall is, is, will be significant. And as Aaron alluded to in the introduction, Nigeria is highly dependent on oil and gas revenues for its uh, government income. Those two factors combine to see, to, we see that around 30% of total government revenue for Nigeria could be at risk in the coming decades. And we see that Nigeria sits within this tier four uh, of countries. Should highlight that those countries most vulnerable to the energy transition um, here, um, or from the loss of revenue, are, are in the top right of this plot. So the combination of the revenue shortfall and the current dependence defines your vulnerability. So the lowest, least vulnerable countries in the bottom left, and as the, in the darker shading, the higher numbered tiers in the top right are the most vulnerable countries. So while Nigeria is not in the top highest tier, it still has around 30% of its revenue streams that are vulnerable in the energy transition. Other, other countries sits alongside uh, Algeria, for example, and Iraq and Saudi Arabia are identified in that same tier. 
So in terms of the ability of different countries to respond, so if we look at this set of petrostates, we, we see their fiscal flexibility varies quite significantly. We've seen some countries have significant sovereign wealth funds, particularly on a per capita basis. So for example, Norway, that could be used to help support the Norwegian transition. That's really not an option available to Nigeria, a highly populous country and that hasn't built up a sovereign wealth fund. So sort of that option doesn't, doesn't, doesn't exist as it doesn't for many of these other petrostates. Petrostate central government debt is already at historically high levels and we've seen that increasing yeah, clearly as a result of the, the, the current pandemic, but, but on a, a longer term uh, wavelength. So through the over the last five or six years, we have seen a significant increase in central government debt. And the graph on the right shows the, the government debt as a percentage of GDP from 0 to 100 percent for that petrostate group. Actually, Nigeria, amongst its peers here, is, is actually quite well placed with relatively low levels of government debt compared to some other countries. Other, for example, petrostates uh, in, in Africa, uh, similar might be, for example, Angola, right to the left of this plot, has a much higher level of government debt. And then finally, the access to credit varies significantly as well, um, and, and in terms of the, the credit ratings and, and, and access to credit. So some, some countries here have um, investment grade credit ratings, whereas other countries here have, uh, whether we show here, have uh, um, speculative, speculative credit ratings, and, and access, access to credit is much more limited. So finally, what I'd like to close out with here is, is some of the implications for policymakers. I think it's it's clear that we have a, an urgent, you know, from the domestic side, it's clear there's an urgent need for diversification. But also we, we stress that the energy transition creates a very significant uh, opportunity to reframe economies, um, move away from the volatility of oil and gas, um, gas markets, so linked to commodity price fluctuations, create sustainable uh, growth, that's viable in a low carbon future. We think it's critical to, to have the creation of incentives to reinvest capital in non-fossil assets, as Janet just spoke about, and, and sim, sim, sorry, stimulate that sustainable growth. Um, and it's good to see that the change in, clearly alongside that, we need a change in subsidies. We need to move all regimes. So we need to move away from um, oil and gas subsidies. And again, it's good to see Oh, it's great to see that Nigeria has, has implemented some of that most, uh, quite recently. We need to reframe that domestic energy supply piece, uh, build out renewables and alternative grid, but also distributed supply, local grids, the democratization of energy. And I think uh, here's a point I really should, we should raise here, uh, that the focus, our focus is around the, the use of oil and gas exports as a revenue, a revenue generator, and as uh, Aaron was talking about, the income, um, foreign exchange in, um, imports. So clearly there is the domestic energy situation, um, but what we need to, what we're looking at here is a slowdown in oil and gas use on a global level, which has impacts for the revenue streams of these petrostates and Nigeria specifically. We talked there about taxation and spending reform, but also there's a piece around the relationship of the national oil companies with central government. What is the role of a national oil company? Does it become a national energy company? Does it become a national investment vehicle? And really, we need to have conversations about what is the role of those companies in the same way that we see the listed companies are having to change and understand, uh, change how um, they operate and sort of what, what their reason for being is and what their strategy is. And I think bringing the people in those national oil companies and employed within the oil and gas industry within these countries along and through the transition is critical to its success too. So that's the, looking at some of the domestic policy implications. But from a national perspective, you know, I would just have to reiterate that it's reducing the petrostates dependence on oil and gas is in the interest of all. It's in the interest of the petrostates and it's in the interest of the non-petrostates, developed countries, developing countries. It's in everyone's interest to, for the world to move away from oil and gas. The international communities can provide technical assistance around taxation and governance reform, but also more broadly through technological expertise uh, and the deployment of capital. And clearly, there's the, the foreign investment side of this too. And of course, there's, there's the support that, that international policymakers can give by supranational programs, the IMF and the World Bank. Now, I think sort of just the final thought here would be around you know, gas. And we talked about is gas a transition fuel? And um, two or three years ago, that was the big um, kind of the big talk is of gas as the transition fuel as we move from oil through gas to a sustainable future. But actually, we, 
countries should not rely on on gas as a global transition fuel i, I think it's almost like the leapfrog countries countries and companies are now talking about leapfrogging gas and going straight from oil to to renewables and this creates big implications for those countries looking to export gas particularly via large projects um, such as lng which are capital sorry liquefied natural gas lng projects large capital invest uh, intensive with long payback periods and those projects if sanctioned have um, you know, potentially risk stranded, uh, become stranded assets and destroying a lot of value both for shareholders of companies but also for um, particularly as the case here for, for the, the countries who are relying on those future revenue streams either via direct investment or through the taxation so so it, this what we're really talking here is about the slowdown of gas from a, a, on a global perspective so I think that's where I'd like to, that's where I'd like to leave leave the, the talk there hopefully that was a that was a good overview of the the report we've put, put together some of the key implications for, for the petrostates generally and then Nigeria specifically uh, and I look forward to, to the discussion Thanks very much, Mike, both for the overview of the report and uh, particularly for the policy recommendations about what can happen next. Now for a reaction from the Nigerian government side, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Kalechi Ofoebo. Kalechi? Okay, thank you so much, Aaron, and um, thank you, Janet. Thank you, Mike, uh, for, your, for the insights that you've provided um contains a lot of um, good stuff and and you uh, you folks have clearly articulated uh specific circumstances in nigeria but you know just to give some context i mean the last um statement that uh, mike made in respect of uh, gas um you know not really being seen as a transitioned fuel um well, and, and you make allusions to leapfrogging. Uh, the question has always been, and I'll start from there and then react to some of the other issues that you've raised. The, the question has always been really, uh, Mike, is, is this leapfrogging a reality or is it just utopian? And, and our standard approach has, has always been to say that that would depend on the way in which we address the myriad of issues that um, you and Janet have raised in the in the course of this presentation, you know, um, of course, those issues will include policy coherence, funding, you know, you know, the relevance of the sort of, the sort of low carbon technologies that are sought to be deployed, and all of that. So, if these issues are not given the focus and the horsepower required to reap the benefits of a low carbon, you know, transfer, then honestly, this whole leapfrogging. Um, intent or objective will be a mirage as far as the Nigerian context is concerned. So for us, until we get policy regulation and other enablers like finance investment um, right as a country, then leapfrogging for us is probably not an option. And that takes us back to gas as a transition fuel, which is our current reality. So like I just said, these, these enablers you know, regulatory policy, finance, investment, and technology are, are, ne are necessary for us to achieve the, the energy transition that all of us have signed up to, especially as a country when we signed up in 2015 to the Paris Agreement. Now, from a regulatory perspective, we are in the cost, in fact, on the verge of passing the Petroleum Industry Bill, the PIB, and that bill recognizes that there has to be a shift, an, a shift of, of focus, as it were, energy shift from oil dependence to gas dependence. And that's why that bill has also um, created another regulatory agency, which has been, you know, to give special focus to the midstream and downstream sectors, which we know will open enormous opportunities for the diversification that we're talking about, as, as well as for investments that would ultimately provide the revenue that would drive the transition. And in that view, we've, we've you know, um, enumerated and uh, provided for all, you know, attractive fiscal incentives for the transportation and the production and transportation of natural gas, and also target significant growth in power generation. 
So like, like Janet, um, you know, rightly identified, we have right now a grid um, generation capacity of about 12,500 megawatts of electricity. But I tell you on a good day, uh, we only can get between, you know, circa 4,000 to 5,000 megawatts to the end consumer. So um, that bill also recognizes that there's a need for, for, for on-grid and for, for the grid and off-grid expansion of capacity and also provides incentives, uh, uh, you know, in that, in that regard. It also, you know, creates the basis for diversification by creating industrial clusters around fertilizers, petrochemicals, manufacturing, agro-business, because like also, I think it was Mike that said that oil and gas just contribute right now about 10% of our GDP to our GDP, even though they, 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 it represents about 80 to 90% of our forex you know, revenue as a country. But the recognition of for diversification has long since been made. And this is why there's, there's a joined up approach at the, at the highest level of government to ensure that all the efforts that have been made towards diversification of the economy, focusing on agriculture, focusing on the real sector, you know, and then again, focusing on gas utilization would all come together to provide, you know, a buffer to the um, projected shortfall in government revenues, which again has been recognized as a clear and present danger uh, from, from a government perspective. So, and from a policy perspective as well, where we, we as a country since 2017, focusing on gas, you know, developed the national gas policy. And our aim, and that still re remains the aim today, you know, subject of course, to what the Federal Executive Council is going to decide um, uh, because right now they are debating the nationally um, determined contributions uh, until that outcome, you know, until the Federal Executive Council releases that report uh, with an approval of what has been recommended. I'm not able to discuss that. But as of today, our 2017 national gas policy aims to, you know, says that we aim to be an attractive gas based industrial nation with a significant presence in national and international markets. And our aim is to move Nigeria from a crude oil export-based economy to an attractive gas-based industrial economy. So gas, you know, uh, you know, is not just, you know, our transition field, it's actually gonna be the, the fulcrum through which we get the revenue to then, you know, embark on, on this transition. So I would, I would stop um, at this point really, uh, basically to, to clarify that, all of the recommendations that, that, that you make in your report, Mike, we recognize. We understand that uh, we are fiscally vulnerable. Uh, government has actually started preparing different scenarios to deal with that, that um, eventuality. Uh, you say Nigeria is projected to lose about 230 billion, but government is also thinking about how to ensure that that impact is mitigated by other measures that we're developing and executing even now as a country. And you know, the orderly transition is one that we've signed up to, but again, to reiterate that as a nation, gas has to play a very big role in that because we have uh, gas resources that we we're not going to have the funding to, to do this. We recognize that the funding is not going to come only from you know, the government. We're looking to um, public-private partnerships to drive that, you know, not just the, the policy, but also the funding. We're also looking to the global financial ecosystem you know, to see how we can leverage whatever funding is, is available to you know, um, mitigate the harshness uh, and the hardship that will be occasioned on the populace if this is not properly managed, you know, like you say, in an orderly manner. So I'm happy to take questions, you know, uh, as they arise, but basically to clarify that, yes, we recognize that leapfrogging is a possibility, but our current reality makes it imperative that gas, you know, needs to play a big role in getting the funding for the orderly transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kalechi, uh, for that overview of the government side of things. And, you know, the, the, I would say the point about, you know, the access to funding and technology and everything that's necessary for leapfrogging is, is well taken. Um, where 
going to move into the discussion yes. portion now. And um, I think maybe we should start with this issue of gas because we've gotten um, uh, lots of questions from audience members about it. Um, and so, uh, Kalechi, I hope you don't mind if I if I start with with you on this, since you're here speaking for the government. Um, so, yes, I, I think the view that you're giving is a view that we hear a lot from Nigeria these days. Uh, you know, people talking about the gas revolution and uh, and that you know Nigeria is really a gas producing country that just happens to have some oil. You know those. Those sorts of things. Um, I, I had, I think, a couple of questions drawing on what came from the audience that maybe it would be helpful for you to address. One is that in terms of the revenue shortfall from oil, um, gas isn't going to provide the same level of rents necessarily that oil provides. Um, so particularly if it's if it goes into the domestic market rather than being exported. So what are government's plans to address that gap, particularly if the idea is to use money for from gas to fund other aspects of you know energy infrastructure in the country? Um, I guess then also in terms of the question of finance, um, where all you you mentioned public private partnerships uh, and 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 that makes sense but in terms of specifically where the financing is going to come from uh you know you have potential financing issues at the level of production uh because you know more and more gas in the country is going to be produced by smaller nigerian companies that can't necessarily you know, finance their own operations. They're going to have to out of their own cash flow. Uh, so, where are they going to get the financing? Where is the financing going to come from for all the infrastructure that's needed, whether you know for power generation or these industrial clusters? Um, you know, particularly you know when we see more and more investors outside the country being wary. Um, so. Uh, can we start there? Okay, thanks, Aaron. And and I think it's it's critical for for us all to understand that this is a journey rather than a destination. That's why it's called a transition. So it's it's a chicken and egg situation for us. So even as I mean, as much as government wants to, you know, go to achieve to attain net zero you know, um, leapfrogging, you know, like, like Mike said, going straight from oil to renewables. The reality, our reality is that, I mean, we can afford that. We cannot fund that transition. We cannot fund that leapfrogging effort, even if, if we use our best endeavors right now. You would know that post the pandemic, I mean, in the wake of the pandemic, I should say, we were basically struggling you know, to finance even uh, basic government operations, basic government activities. We're right now highly leveraged. And only last week, another request was sent by Mr. President to the Senate to, um, to, to, for a loan you know, uh, in excess of $6 billion. Now, at the end of the day, don't forget that um, even with our best endeavors, uh, you know, and our commitment to the transition, government is not standing still. Government still has the obligation of providing infrastructure and other amenities to, to, to the populace. Government still needs to fund salaries of civil service. Government, you know, and all the, everything that the government is responsible for delivering, we need to deliver on a day-to-day -day basis. Otherwise, you know, we're going to have a real problem with the teeming population out there, you know, attacking, you know, you know causing mayhem in, in, in government already. We're seeing signs of that happening as, you know, er, um, poverty becomes even more endemic in the country. So as, as long as we, we don't have all the financing or the technology required to make the transition straight to renewables, then we're going to have to ask ourselves realistically, what can we do? 
Recognizing that there will be a shortfall in revenue, like you say, that the revenue from gas investments and, and gas utilization is not going to be um, on the same kill as you know oil revenues. That's that's understandable, and that's why that's that that policy is conflated with other policies on diversification. I already, like I said, oil and gas is, is right now only about 10% of our GDP. And the government has long since recognized that there's a need to keep focusing on other sectors with a view to expanding their role in the economy, you know, even while um, oil and gas starts to, to diminish. But while it diminishes, we need to commercialize what we have so that whatever we can get from that process adds on to what we have as a country, you know, to support a national economy and ultimately to support our transition to net zero. Thank you very much, Kalechi, for that response. Um, let's see, maybe we should widen out a bit. Uh, I think this is a good place given the discussion and talk about COP26. So, it's coming up and I just wondered if we could get some reactions and, and you know anybody can answer about what could success look like. Um, you know, different countries go into COP, different actors go in wanting different things. So, you know, what could success look like for Nigeria, um, you know, how can the country take the most advantage of the moment? And, um, and, and what's the best that other countries can offer out of that process? I don't know, Janet, uh, Kalachi, any, any of you can come in. Well, let me, um, let me give Kalachi a break and, uh, <laughs> and come in first. I think um, we we have to we have to look at COP twenty six um, as uh, again as I said at the beginning, it, the purpose of this when we set out the Paris Agreement after five years was for because we we look at the first chunk of fifteen years if you like up to twenty thirty and we also look up to mid century to twenty fifty, but if you take it in in a in a chunk of five years, um, then we 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 collectively want to be looking all of us at how far have we come um, in terms of the commitments we made in 2015 as governments towards reaching those targets? Now, let's just remember one of those targets and the one that the mitigation element of the goals is aiming at is uh, keeping global warming down to 1.5 degrees. Okay, now, how do we do that? This is, you know, put, put simply, this relates mostly to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And how do we reduce our emissions and where do they come from? Um, and how do we calculate all of that is, is really the work that, that the governments do in their, in, their technical, in their technical details. But what I can say is that the latest um, scientific research on this shows that given where we are now, the efforts that all the governments have made to date, um, according to their uh, uh, NDCs, their nationally determined contributions that they, they each set out back in 2015 or, or since then, um, we're still on track for almost a three degree rise, something like 2.6, which is almost double our target of 1.5. And that is if we just continue on the track that we are now on with the commitments that people have made up to now. So that's why we all put into the Paris Agreement that at the five-year point, we would look and see if we needed to accelerate our efforts. And I think that scientific evidence is showing that we do need to accelerate our efforts. And that's why as, as the chair, currently our, it's our job, um, and it depends uh, obviously who's in the chair. Next, the next COP, COP27 will be an African country chairing. It rotates like that. But the, the job of the chair is to remind everybody of their commitments. So, you know, our job as the chair is to say to each country, look, we're going to have to increase our, our ambition on this because otherwise we're not going to stay even in touch with that 1.5 degree target. 
So, and I can see, I can see Kalachi nodding on this because, you know, every government is facing this challenge because the science is telling us, the science is telling us that we haven't done enough yet. So the UK from its perspective, again, you know, trying to be a, trying to be a good example, uh, came out with it with a, you know, in, increased effort, uh, an, inc an enhanced NDC in, uh, in December to come up with a new carbon budget since then. Um, it's uh, pro uh, pledged um, a doubling of um, the UK's bilateral contribution on climate financing for the next five years, as compared to the last five years, up to 11.6 billion uh, pounds. So, you know, the, the, there is an attempt and even on adaptation, people think adaptation is something only for the developing world. Well, no, um, uh, the UK is an island and, and has its, its challenges when it comes to resilience to, to weather shocks and particularly for things like flooding and our supply lines. So our adaptation um, uh, efforts have, have focused in that direction. So I think each country has to take a look at this and say, what, what can we do more? So when it comes to Nigeria, Again, you know, as as Kalechi has has outlined, every government has um, so many different things which are which are pulling on it in every direction. Yes, it has to do daily service delivery for its people. At the same time, it's also the government the government's responsibility to demonstrate on behalf of the people that leadership going forward. And and leadership means creating your future vision and your future space. And how is it going to be? So if we say the future has got to change from where it is now for all of us then that process of designing the transition is where government has to sit. And, and it is quite right. Government's role is really its primary role because nobody else can do this. It's to set the legislation, to set the regulation, and to make, the, make sure that those things are implemented properly and effectively and, and, uh, and, and with efficient, uh, as efficient as it can be. And, and balance off those different those different uh, 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 pressures. But if government does not set an example and does not set the, the the future target to say gas is just our transition and we are moving to somewhere else, we are intending to move beyond gas. Gas is not our endpoint. Gas is our transition, and that's what it means. Our future energy mix. Our goal is for it to be like this. And, and you know our, our our job as the COP presidency is to say to Nigeria, okay, really define out, spell out what that goal is going to be. Put that in your nationally determined contribution. Put that in your adaptation communication. Spell out in your adaptation communication what the first priority is and how much that is already in your planning and where you've pledged your domestic finances and where your gaps are. And that's what the, the world globally together we, we work on um, as we come to COP26. And what we've got to come out of COP26 with is the pathway that the next presidency of COP26, as we go into COP27, which will be an Africa COP, will take forward. So it, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. COP26 is a kind of point along the way, but it, it is the place where all of us together have to be, be continuing to, to move so that, you know, we, those things, you know, we all say like, leave no one behind. So that can become a reality. Okay, thank you so much, Janet. And honestly, you're, you're right. Um, but the whole notion of the transition from our perspective as well, and I think from the perspective of resource rich developing nations and for low income countries as well, is that it has to be a just transition. And that just transition recognizes the specificities, the specifics of the circumstances of the countries that have to you know, make this transition. And, and as, a, as a country, we signed up to that to the Paris Agreement. So we have commitments, and we're taking those commitments seriously. And that's why um, the the, uh, uh, the national mantra is that the, the, um, gas is not the destination fuel, but just the transition fuel. But you're right. Um, we then need to um, very clarify, you know, what that energy mix would be, and what the end game, the timelines. Is, is also going to be, and I'm, and I'm sure that, let me not preempt the NDCs, like you, like you said, you know, you, you, that would soon be um, delivered to yourselves after being debated and approved by the Federal Executive Council, because I'm sure that that would have some sort of clarity, more clarity about our go forward strategies. But again, even without seeing that, you know, even without that document being in public domain, uh, Nigeria has made progress since 
2015 when we signed up to the, 20, um, to the Paris Agreement. So from a policy perspective, we have clearly enunciated the climate, you know, climate policy and um, climate change policy, which outlines our climate action and which also you know, talk, um, uh, you know, em embeds the resilience that we need, we are trying to you know, um, infuse into our daily, you know, our daily life, as it were, for want of a better expression. That policy is all encompassing and also restates our commitment to, you know, to the 1.5 degrees Celsius um, world by 2050, the turn of the uh, mid of the century. And as a as a country as well, you know, we have taken action on flaring you know, on gas flaring, which is now down from in, in 2015, it was 20%, as we speak, it's about 7%. And not only have we taken action to reduce flaring, even the ones, uh, even the, the amount of flares remaining, we are taking action to commercialize, in other words, to make the flares more useful for development, you know, and for revenue earning for, for the people as well and for government, respectively. So we're not just leaving the flares anymore. We recognize that these are ma major sources of, of emission. We have also um, reduced our current rate of resource uh, of resource consumption. So, uh, and, and thanks to OPEC cuts as well, which uh, our obligations to OPEC we respect, you know, um, and 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 so we've come from a point where we're, we're producing X amount daily, and we've reduced that significantly with you know with the concomitant you know multiplier effects on the amount of um, you know emissions that are. That you know that you would typically have in the course of producing to, to to the normal extent that we do as a country, you know, and and we've forged very many public-private partnerships, you know, which basically serve as a platform for developing strategies and you know developing incentives that drive those strategies and ensure that the overarching objective of getting to net zero um, is achieved. So we haven't just, um, um, you know, not done anything really, and, and like the NDCs that will be delivered to you shortly would 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 um, uh, see would verify as well. However, we recognise that in spite of our best endeavours, in spite of what we've done thus far, we ask ourselves realistically: Are we on course, you know, to achieving the twenty percent? Um, reduction of greenhouse gas emission by 20, uh, by 2030. So th these are the questions that we constantly have to ask ourselves. And if we think that we're falling short, you know, by you know by a, by any parameter, then we would ask. We, we would talk about it. We would ask for any any kind of assistance that we require, you know, just to make to meet those obligations. And that's exactly what we're saying. And we and we will leverage whatever resources that we have that will help us meet our long-term obligations. And that's why we're saying that in that whole mix, gas has to be a discussion. It doesn't mean that we're not taking steps, you know, in the renewable space. I mean, the last time the vice president launched an initiative, you know, an off-grid initiative that would power, um, I think, 5 million homes with solar technology off grid. So that only, you know, that not only reduces the pressure on grid, because once you talk, you know, but also provides the energy access that is part of our commitments as part of our, you know, our measures to infuse. So we're taking all of these steps and what pulls it together basically is the policy and the NDCs, which will be delivered, I think within the next two weeks or so, so long as the FEC has had time to approve it, that should be in public domain. And then you can better appreciate what the courses of action Nigeria has undertaken with a view to achieving um, compliance. Thank you very much, Kaleshi. It's such a busy time, like a lot of work's going on. Mike, did you want to come in? Yeah, sure. I mean, and th thanks. I think just to sort of kind of build on the, the two comments we've just heard there. I mean, I think it's, it's very much worth re reiterating that sort of our analysis here and that the issues that we're really looking to highlight are around the fiscal resilience side of things, but particularly from the investment in the hope of future revenues from exports. So, and, and so really it's, okay, as opposed to necessarily the domestic energy uh, situation, where I, I think clearly there's like, there's likely to be some gas use for domestic energy in, in Nigeria and other 
uh, other, other similar uh, countries in a similar position in the energy transition. However, what we're, we're really highlighting is the slowdown of, of, of gas demand globally and the leapfrog that some countries will take, which will impact that demand. And therefore, the real implications on fiscal planning, for, and uh, particularly through investment via, for example, uh, Nigerian uh, National Petroleum Company into large projects such as Syria LNG. So, um, so what we want to avoid is investment into such projects predicated on future um, sales of gas where volumes of demand will fall, prices fall, and therefore those projects and those investments totally fail to deliver the returns that are expected to the Nigerian government. And that, that capital could be much, far better deployed elsewhere for future revenue streams. And that could be in um, and that could be into renewable development, um, or it could be into other, or it can be into other um, other um, other industries too. And I think why we wrote this report was really to raise global awareness of all of these issues. It's absolutely not what we're not saying here is um, what Nigeria should do from a domestic energy piece. It's around the fiscal resilience side of things and raising awareness. Um, particularly on a, on a global scale, particularly in the run-up to COP, around how both dom domestic policymakers within petrostates, some of the, the evils they have, but crucially how the international community at large can help support that through a number of different lenses as well. So I, I sort of hope that really kind of clarifies the, the position and I think ties together some of the kind of the comments that, that, that we're talking on there. Okay, Mike, and, 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 and thank you for that as well. Um, for us, like I, keep, like I say again, it's a journey. The, the beautiful thing about this is at the level of government, like Janet has identified, we set regulation, we set policy, but we realize that it, it we're just one tree, we're not the forest. It will take stakeholder collaboration to make this happen. And of course, the IOCs, the NOC, those are very critical stakeholders, you know, and proactive participants in this process. Uh, only yesterday, the Dutch court, you know, um, uh, ruled against Shell and saying, look, you have to cut your uh, your emissions by 45% by, 20, by 2030. 2030 is just nine years away. Now, that is inevitably going to have a domino effect, a multiplier effect across, you know, the IOC um, community, wherever they're operating, because that's going to embolden um, other, you know, um, in public interest groups to bring similar sort of litigation in the different countries, Nigeria inclusive. And I know that this would happen within the next six months in Nigeria as well. And Shell in complying with that direct, with that ruling, even though they've said they're, they're going to appeal it, but even before appealing, they had already publicized steps that were taken progressively to comply to, to meet that obligation. Now, if Shell does anything in the Netherlands, then the Nigerian people are going to say, oh, hang on, um, what is good for the goose is also good for the Ganda. So if you're going to do it elsewhere, then you had better do it here as well. And, and, and this is the sort of thing that also drives compliance, because if a Shell does it, if ExxonMobil does it, if Total does it in country, then together we're all headed towards the compliance, you know, attaining the objective that we all have signed up to for ourselves. And so I'm quite, quite confident, Mike, that, you know, um, early days yet for us in, in terms of, you know, seeing the mega investments in, for instance, green hydrogen, like you'd see in other, you know, uh, other parts of the world. Have we had the sort of significant investments in renewables that would create a significant dent in our transition journey to, to enable that leapfrogging, for instance? No, we haven't. But are we hopeful that that would happen with the ruling, the, the kind of ruling that came yesterday from the Dutch court? Absolutely, because that gives us renewed hope that as people are then forced, as IOCs, NOCs are forced into, you know, this sort of behavior, you know, to, to focus them sharply on their on their obligations and their commitments, you know, to, to net zero. We know that we will be the direct beneficiaries of that as a people, so that we will see those investments come in country, driven by the need to comply, of course, by, you know, and, and you, you also talk about investor pressure, you know, 
show you were, were your two examples, Mike. So we hope that that would continue because as investors put pressure on IOCs, for instance, to comply, IOCs are present in Nigeria and we hope that we can reap the benefit of that pressure out there in country, you know, and that would also then spur other investments. So ultimately, if Nigeria is seen as an investment destination for, um, for, for the renewable space, you know, like, like Janet I'll, I'll, um, rightly identified, even though we're not major polluters, but the sort of industrialization that we, that we aim to achieve is going to need a lot of you know, energy. So if that energy can be green energy from the start, from get-go, why not? That's our preference as a country. So if this sort of investor pressure is going to cause people to invest in country and help us attain compliance even faster, we welcome that. Thanks very much, Kaleshi. And just to say, we, we did get a couple of questions on renewables uh, in the chat. And, uh, you know, taking into consideration <laughs> everything that you've said here, um, are there other things that the government is doing right now uh, to make the path of renewables, solar and wind, easier in the country? Are there policy changes? Uh, you know, are there things going on to de-risk the sector uh, that would make it easier for investors come in? We've had a lot of interest about that. So just if you have a quick thought about that. Absolutely, and, and, and it starts at the policy level. I mean, already NMPC, the, the national oil company, has um, expressed the intent to transition to an energy company you know, rather than just an oil and gas or petroleum company. And, and that and I, is already speaking to its co-venturers, its joint venture partners in about investments in this regard. So that is already happening. I mean, I mean, NMPC as a, as, 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 uh, as a corporation has uh, already has developed a biomass fuels policy for, for, you know, to power the vehicles in, in country and is actively pursuing that policy as we speak. Now, when you come to the macro level of, of the country, you know, coordinated by, from the office of the vice president, we are, we are setting up a decarbonization office on the back of the NDC's announcements that, that would happen. The climate uh, actions that have been outlined in the climate change um, policy that has recently been rejigged as well, um, that, that, that would also feed into the decarbonization office. And we're going to draw on the different resources available to us uh, from the different MDAs, the ministries, the departments, and the agencies. Basically, everybody joining together to say, okay, this transition has to happen. How is that going to happen in our specific context as Nigeria and Nigerians taking into consideration our reali reali realities of, the, of funding, of technology, and of population explosion and of the lack of energy access and of increasing poverty and restiveness uh, of, 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 of the populace and, of course, insecurity. Because again, in deploying the technology and in building infrastructure, you also have to think about the security of the, of the, of the infrastructure being deployed and the, the people who are supposed to deploy this infrastructure. And then also thinking about human capital development, which is required to domesticate these technologies, you know, when they come in, when they are uh, in country, when, when they are We've also spoken about the intellectual property challenges for us because the, 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 the rights, the property rights attached to some of it, to, to these technologies and the, and the payments required, the licensing um, payments required are so huge sometimes that we need to ask ourselves as, as a nation, how are we going to deal with this? But we're having these conversations. And like I said, the decarbonization office should be set up in the office of the vice president will pull all of this together on the back of the NDCs that will be delivered shortly. And, and so as a nation, we will have a line of sight you know, everyone having a joined up approach as to how we um, transition together as part of the global community. And then uh, of course, respecting our commitments made in 2015. Thank you very much, Kalechi. It's great to hear the government thinking along those lines. Just as a final question, I, I wanted to give each panelist uh, a chance to answer quickly. Nigeria in, 
discussions about what goes on in the energy sector, especially in forums like these, is often held up, I think sometimes unfairly as an example of like what not to do. But I, I would like to give each of you the chance to say, you know, what is one thing that Nigeria can do in the context of the energy transition to be a leader and an example for its peers? Uh, Janet, would you like to start? I'm, I'm, I'm so Aaron, I've just been told that the minister needs me. I need to exit at this point, if you don't mind. I will come back after responding. And if you're still on, then I can I can answer if you don't mind, please. Of course. Thank you so much for your time. Yes. One really second. Thank you. So uh, if I uh, if I give Kalechi his uh, his time to respond to the minister again, I I think um, one thing that that Nigeria can do um, is is really and, and again as I I think you know there's a big influence um, amongst uh, countries in the region um, the sub region um, and you know uh, Nigeria is a big country so I I think that setting um, that forward looking direction that says how gas is the transitional source of energy and, and where the ultimate destination is um, with, with real you know, quantifiable and measurable targets um, is the best thing that from a government perspective um, one, one would like to see because that enables everybody else, particularly the private sector and also communities and others to consider what their, uh, what their contribution to that overall plan is. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I mean, great question. I, I, I'd echo there what Janet just just said, and but and, and but I'd also touch on you know the concept of the emerging petro states that, that I highlighted during the talk. I mean, if, for example, countries like such as Uganda, Mauritania, Mozambique, and, and also some in so, uh, central south, southern America, for example, Guyana, um, and really actually help share the experience of um, you know it, through sort of openness and transparency around some of the past experiences of the petro state and some of the the issues that that creates, but also that very much that forward-looking piece that becoming a petro state and becoming reliant on oil is really not a good strategy through the energy transition for uh, for, for many of these countries and and and, and sharing that experience and, and showing leadership there to, through through that to, to to show actually the path is not to you know for sustainable growth is not through becoming a, an oil and gas dependent nation and I think sharing that um, with with the countries looking to do that would be uh, would be particularly important as Sam says in, in kind of from a forward-looking perspective. Thank you, Mike. Kalechi, uh, you're back with us. So I guess you get the last word. One thing that uh, Nigeria can do to be a leader in the energy transition. Wow. Um, many things, really. I think um, the transition will begin to, uh, would, would succeed or fail based on the clarity of policy and the consistency and sincerity of implementation. I think that we have the unique opportunity, you know, given our size uh, and the size of our resources as well, to show people that we, we honor our commitments, we're serious about the transition. And that would be by the clarity of the policies we enunciate, as well as how we go about, you know, implementing it, drawing on the resources available to us. However, we need to recognize the specifics of our circumstances and people would understand that we are doing what we do, and, 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 and our indices also will bear testimony to that, that we do what we do, recognizing that we are in, in, in a unique position. We need to do what we can do to comply, and other countries looking at us can then learn from our example, you know, because they will be in maybe somewhat similar situations in petro states that Mike talked about. And, and, and you know what mistakes that we make, they can correct those mistakes as well. We are already neck deep in, in, in dependence on, on fossil fuels. We recognize that, but we want to get that right. And that and leapfrogging would be a good option, Mike and, and, and Aaron. However, um, if we can if we lack the resources to do that, then uh, we will do what we can do. That's it. Thank you very much, Kalechi, and I think that's a good note to end on. Um, so we're a little bit over time, and uh, while I, for one, could, I think, keep discussing these things for hours, we'll, we'll have to leave it there. 
Uh, I personally really enjoyed hearing about all the work going on ahead of COP, and I'm sure we all look forward to seeing the outcomes and how the process can help Nigeria and other countries respond to the challenges of the energy transition. So on behalf of Carbon Tracker, I'd like to thank all of our very busy panelists for their time and hard work on these critical issues and all of you for attending. And just to say a recording of the webinar will be available on Carbon Tracker's website and YouTube channel after the event. And any slides will be shared uh, tomorrow on Friday. So on behalf of all of us, please take care, uh, enjoy your day. And thanks so much again, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.